Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Server Room. I'm your host Alsharin. I have another special guest with me today. It's Ram Prakash. So he is the director of AI research at Managed Engine. Uh, it's a pleasure having you here. So in our previous episode, we spoke about how LLMs can benefit enterprises. Uh, so today we'll be talking about the future of LLMs. So before we deep dive into the topic, um, what are the capabilities of LLMs beyond generative AI? Can you just elaborate about that? Sure, I'll share in. Uh, first, appreciate the opportunity. It's a quite cool setup you've got here. My pleasure. <laughs> so uh, yes. Over the last six months or so, we've been hearing a lot of noise about LLMs, generative AI, are they going to take over the world uh, and whatnot, right? The hype cycle has reached its peak and it's nothing new for AI. AI is always known to overpromise and then under deliver. But this time around, things are different. So ever since 2012-13, we have been seeing the uh, uptick of AI because primarily of two reasons. One is We've got a lot of cheaper sensors for data collection. For example, my watch tells me the number of steps I have taken, my heart rate. Ten years back, this was something superhuman, right? I mean, why would you track your heart rate for an average healthy person? Why would you track the number of steps and store it forever and then plot it on a graph and see how well you've gone up or down? So one, cheaper data collection capabilities. And then two is the infinite power of cloud. So yes, you've collected a ton of data and then you put everything to the cloud, you process it. Then comes AI where the data collection and data generation and data storage capabilities have increased. But then there is a missing piece where you look at the data and you're trying to make sense of it. So AI comes in and helps you fill that gap. As far as we have seen, uh, the consumer space first started off because we don't pay for our search engines, we don't pay for our social networks, and instead we give back a lot of our personal data and we get these services back for free. But the enterprise world was totally different. So enterprise had a late mover advantage like it always does. I mean, think about it. We didn't have enterprise mobile apps. The, we had social media, we had everything on our mobile. But enterprise mobile apps took a cool five years to come in. But today a lot of enterprise work gets, on, gets done on mobile. Same with AI. In the last six months, we have seen some generative capabilities with AI. You know, we as humans, we always think there are certain things which only humans can do, right? And uh, uh, let, let's take it as X. The value of X has been diminishing over years. There are a lot of other technologies or other things that, I mean, we, we have a belief that the whole world is centered around us. So, I mean, there was a, a theory where we are the center of the universe. But then as our technology grew, we realized, oh, we are just a small bit uh, in the whole grand scheme of things. And we are not at the center of the universe. And slowly things evolved. It's not just human beings. So everything is a complex system. So, and, and we tend to just simplify it. So think about it. A donkey has so many things going on within it. But then we just use it to, uh, you know, help us carry loads. But when was the last time you saw a donkey in a city? Uh, that that's a whole different debate together. We don't even see donkeys. Yes, when was the last time I saw a donkey? I'm, as we speak, I'm just wondering, never. But yeah, we tend to uh, think we have a lot of things which other organisms, other technologies are not able to do. So this generative AI, before, I mean, the last six months ago, we were thinking, oh yes, it's only possible for a human to write a well-drafted essay. But then the whole uh, bigger models came in and then they said, okay, I can write essays as good as you. Even today, we say there are certain things which only humans can do. For example, uh, show empathy, right? Uh, have sentiments and uh, things like move around, things like common sense. But now these large language models have cracked the whole notion of language. And if you see language is something very unique to us. And we show our empathy, we show our sentiments, I'm angry on you, I'm, I'm happy with you, I feel sad for you. Whatever it is, it comes through language. And now these large language models have been able to crack this language. So it's only a matter of time. They are going to touch us in all aspects of our life. And things which we were thinking only humans can do, 
is going to be automated thanks to a lot of these technologies. And like I said, it all ties back to your data processing capabilities, your data generation capabilities, the amount of compute that we have in our uh, in our ecosystem today. I mean, everybody has access to supercomputers because thanks to the cloud and, and your smartphone is much bigger than the average computer just seven, eight years ago. So things are evolving. Uh, today, LLMs are able to generate stuff. Uh, tomorrow, it will have a lot of touch points in the way we operate. And it's going to be exciting times ahead. Uh, rightly, you talk, uh, you spoke about uh, data. Uh, literal data is the backbone uh, of an AI system. So um, what kind of data sets do you think will make an AI more humanoid? As you spoke about uh, uh, humanoid AI, right? So what data sets do you think will make it more humanoid in the coming years? Perfect. So uh, we're looking at two different technologies here. One is, uh, I mean, so far what these, uh, whatever we spoke has only been digital, right? Uh, Chat GPT and LLMs and LLMs that can generate images. All of it has been digital. And then there's a whole different notion of robotics where, you know, uh, we keep uh, building uh, robots to do stuff to, I would say the growth in the field of LLMs is in a much larger scale when compared to robotics. I mean, we haven't cracked general purpose robotics yet, right? So we have robots that do specific tasks. That was the world with ML as well. We had ML models that would help you find sentiment, but the model that would help you find sentiment in social media posts would not be able to find the sentiment in, let's say, a help desk email, in a support email, because this is very formal. And a social media review is like very colloquial. You used all profane words. So it's very easy to find a sentiment. So, but today the difference that LLMs have brought in is about being general purpose, right? Because it has been trained on a ton of data, trained on all content that has been generated by humans over the years and that is available on the internet. And I mean, the reason we put those stuff on the internet was very different. We were doing search engine optimization and we did SEO because SEO search engines actually give us back traffic. Now, the big question ahead of us is, oh, an LLM has scrapped, scraped all my content. Will it give me back any traffic? Actually, it does not give you back any traffic. So the whole notion of um, we had graphical user interfaces. Now you have linguistic user interfaces where you go ask questions, you get the answer right on the same interface. So we'll have to see where that goes. Sorry, I'm drifting away from the topic. Coming back, <laughs> what kind of data sets do you need for humanoid like robots? The robots, gen general purpose robots are still a long time away. You know, uh, in fact, uh, I was talking to a, a robotics expert a couple of months back and, and he had to say that general purpose graspers, forget robots, general purpose graspers are not available. I mean, there's a boom in e-commerce. But then you have the same, uh, I wouldn't call it assembly line. You have the same packaging line for, uh, let's say, in a typical e-commerce inventory. And you cannot have the same grasper for packing a banana, the same grasper for packing an iPhone, the same grasper for packing a silk sari, right? You need to have different kinds of stuff. So, and given this is hardware, there is a lot of things going on into it. Uh, these kind of data that, that has to be generated will... Today we are just capturing our, I mean, your Apple Watch today can talk about your cadence. I didn't, I didn't even know what a cadence was, but then it, it kind of tells you the balance between your left leg and right leg. And I'm sure we are in the process of data collection to do a lot of things. Uh, of course, there is a lot of privacy and other things that come into this as well. So maybe when humanoid robots are smart enough and when these large language models keep evolving to more general purpose things. I see the combination of both coming together and helping us. Remember, we talked about empathy. We talked about, I mean, today a pilot is there on a plane just because we have faith in the pilot as a pilot. And we, we need human caregivers or human doctors just to ensure, or maybe subtly put, it's just to blame when things go wrong. Oh yes, the flight crashed or oh, the pilot is at mistake. The patient died, maybe the doctor is at mistake. The caregiver is not uh, uh, is not giving proper care. Maybe the person is not empathetic. But now with LLM's learning language, all of these can be uh, made easier. The only thing is how do we make them accountable? And when you add robotics to them, 
and that becomes like crazy value at the same time there's also a crazy fear of you no know, singularity is coming in what if these guys uni- unite and come and kill us yeah. uh, what if i mean there are certain things that are unique to us things about uh, learning from history so yes we we all have uh, you know a few people whom we are very friendly with and that's because of i mean we all knew each other as random colleagues random college mates random friends and then things get really good with certain set of people things get really ugly with a certain set of people and it's because of history so now with llms opening up all of these will come in and once humanoids start coming in um i think things will get very different but a lot of times people ask oh yes is my job going to be taken away uh, it's the fear for most people i think yeah yeah i don't think so i mean uh, let's say 100 150 years back our primary job was hunting but today we still have jobs to do and even things like telephone switching when when switching was automated you still have a lot of jobs around telecom look at the kind of industries that it spurred and there were new kind of jobs that were created and even with respect to things like auditing uh, managing finance books i mean you had computers that can crunch all the numbers and give you but then look at the kind of jobs that created around it so nothing to worry about job loss or ai becoming sentient singular ai coming in even today it's managed by a bunch of people right i mean who, who let's say government is just a bunch of people and and if they turn evil there's always a chance uh, and then we have a legal framework and all of that so so i'm sure this technology development is in line and it's only here to help us for the most part yeah, ho- hopefully what you say <laughs> comes true uh and also um i recently came across a lot of uh, robotics and uh, i uh, saw a robot uh, not in person um i saw a video of a spot by boston dynamics and it resembles an actual dog and it walks like an actual dog and its gestures are also like a dog uh, i mean it it slides its head and um, and it can walk even on a terrain on a flat surface even on a staircase um so when i looked at it it was very impressive how much um robotics have developed in the coming years so um that aside and also uh, the discussion right now is about ai being sentient as you said so how do you think that would be do you have any of your thoughts about ai being sentient hmm. so yeah lots of respect about uh, respect for boston dynamics they they've been doing a tremendous job and uh, this whole notion of uh ai being sentient will only happen with inputs from human i mean that is why we still have the prompts mm-hmm. or from a robotics parlance now let's say we have a robot that goes around our office delivers mail uh you can ask a uh, coffee up, uh, to it and and of course your watch is telling you to walk up i mean uh, stand up and walk mm-hmm. but still let's say you have a robot that delivers coffee that brings mail to your place and uh, does the work of a typical office assistant uh primarily towards the manual labor part of things now where robotics is evolving is it is trying to ask help to humans now let's say the robotics wants to go from the ninth floor to the sixth floor and then it's not tall enough to reach the lift buttons yes yeah and then it stands there and there's a display on it and it says can you help me reach the sixth floor yes. oh yes then there is a human who opens the lift door goes and presses the number 6 so oh, it 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 works out happily it realizes it's sixth floor because it has computer vision capabilities amazon astro as i think is very short it cannot yeah. navigate yeah. you know taller things yeah so these interactions with human in the process are helping these become better uh now things like construction things like heavy machinery where it's dangerous for humans to do it i think there will be a lot of value add and if large language models are being able to infer at the edge today that's the challenge to to run an inference of a large language model you need gpus you need server grade computers and what not the day is not very far away where we will be able to distill these models and put them on the smaller computing power available on your uh, robot so the day is not far especially things like compute i mean things like construction things like heavy machinery where it's risky things like uh, you know you have a lot of garbage dump removal startups where they use robots to navigate the space again a lot of it can be human assisted to start off with than completely autonomous where 
I mean, think about a pilot who is working from home and controlling the flight. Think about a, a person who is maneuvering a robot through a dump yard and then trying to clear out all harmful waste or trying to segregate waste for that matter. Especially in developing countries, this is being a very big challenge where human talent is available and unfortunately these people have to get in and a lot of issues around it. So what I see is once these general purpose graspers start coming in, there is this example, uh, it's a commonly quoted example on the internet, you might want to look up. Uh, there, there is a kid who is trying to find his Easter egg and then he and his sister are trying to figure that out. Um, this younger kid spots the Easter egg, but he's not able to reach it. Uh, what he does is he takes a shovel and pulls the Easter egg down. Now, if you see in his training data, he has never seen a shovel being used to pull down an Easter egg. He's seen a shovel to do things what a shovel does. but this will be an inflection point. The day this kind of inference is being done by a robot, where you know you have this generative capability, you have this emergent capability where in your training data you've never seen a shovel being used to pick things on something uh, that is not reachable for your hands. That day we will reach a good level of general purpose robotics and that plus LLMs will be a superhuman combo. Um, even though there are a lot of um, advancements and a lot of uh, use cases for uh, AI as well as uh, AI powered robots, I think there are few people who are still skeptical about AI. They are, uh, they are still unsure about how it would be in the future and uh, w whether it would be dangerous. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, I would say, I mean, anybody could become dangerous. Now, let's say there are five people running the government and, and these five people collude together and, and, and do something they're not supposed to do. But at least you have a legal framework today. Uh, we don't know what will happen if these uh, robots are going to, I mean, robots plus LLMs are going to take over the legislation and start dictating things around us. I don't think uh, that is quite going to happen because... Uh, most of these have a kill switch and uh, they are trained on data. See, the only thing that is different from what we have seen from the past is an emergent behavior. And it's already in nature. Think about it. You manufacture a car, you build everything to specifications and everything is on a straight line. You decide, oh, the door handle is 45 centimeters or 45 millimeters long. You decide all of that. But take nature. Think about a corn stock. We don't engineer a corn stock. We don't engineer a mango. I mean, what size should it be? Uh, what taste should it be? I mean, there are certain variables that you can control, but these variables do not have a direct impact on the outcome. So today, data scientists are like that. Your traditional computer engineers were somebody sitting on an assembly line where they code each and every input, each and every aspect of your software program, of your app. But that's not the case with AI engineers and data scientists. They are more like farmers. They plant the seeds, they fertilize the soil, they keep watering at frequent intervals. They, they generally do a very high level monitoring of the crop and then it gives you the output. So the same is with AI models. And now what if one person that you, one ingredient that you put in uh, turns the mango sour? Or what if it kills the crop itself? There is a possibility. There is still a possibility. But Legal regulation should come up real fast, especially in terms of creating AI and deploying AI. I mean, creating AI itself is a challenge. It needs a lot of personal data. I mean, what if my cadence information goes out? Let's say there's a terminal cancer patient. You give all of his data to an AI model to see what kind of treatment he would need. That is good. But let's say your food delivery app is sharing data with your insurance company and they find that you are having a milkshake at 11 p.m. in the night every day through the week and the insurance company is jacking up your prices. This is still possible with today's model, right? So a lot of questions about the data that is being used for the creation of AI. And then a lot of questions about the deployment of AI in mission critical stuff like, let's say, a treatment plan or a recruitment system. I mean, we have all read articles about how uh, some companies AI actually didn't uh, allow certain genders resumes for a particular profile. We've, we've been hearing all of that stories. 
today the legal framework has not evolved meaning technology has evolved like super fast but legal frameworks have not really evolved but is there a way can we control this because the data scientists themselves don't have control on what is doing what what the model is doing so it is still a challenge there are a lot of unknown unknowns in this area uh, but i would say it's let's not worry about i mean i i am sure people in the calculator era people in the computer era would be worried about computers taking their jobs calculators taking their jobs so it it's not going to become singular it's not going to take our jobs i am sure ai is here to assist us after listening to you i think i am hopeful and i'm sure even our audience would uh, feel hopeful about uh, the advancements in ai because uh, as i told you earlier uh, people are sh- still unsure about the future of ai because it's sometimes when we look at a robot or uh, when we look at all the capabilities of ai sometimes it is um, very weird of uh, on how much uh, it has developed in the past few years so it's really hopeful listening to you talk about uh, how it might actually help humanity so that's really great so uh, these are uh, we get about all the advancements are there any limitations or uh, challenges when it comes to ai as of now what do you think well one thing i see is uh, the today's ai systems are very compute heavy and data heavy right you need you need to to build a reasonable llm that that performs reasonably well in a common context you will need thousands of gpus terabytes of data uh, trillions of uh, uh, weights in your neural network to train the model the entry barrier to this is very high today so will it cause monopolies probably yes the technology isn't small enough i mean there's a mass scale adoption but are there mass scale production capabilities no the entry barrier to building a reasonable llm is very high today and the amount of data can be a single powerhouse all the data that is going into one company one uh, country all of these could become challenges but uh, hopefully i see a lot of technical advancements where you can build ai with limited amounts of data with limited amounts of compute hopefully they are coming our way uh, yes as you said um, uh, now um, there there's also a very big discussion about companies owning data and i think we should host another podcast if we have to talk about all that uh, so thanks for sharing your thoughts on that as well and um, apart from this uh, let's say that our future is a fully sentient uh, ai um, so how would it help an organization or even maybe a smaller company uh, do you think there are any risks to that uh, are there any advantages uh, what do you think about that? Mm-hmm. Well, one thing I see is a lot of creative processes. I mean, Romer, we spoke about how we were thinking only we are creative, only we can write essays. But now all of a sudden, a model is able to generate images. And all it does is just a random initialization. Now, there is an AI that can generate music. And it, it just put in, puts in random notes and then here you have some piece of music. And then it continuously improves it by looking at, oh, I did this random pattern. Uh, it only had 100 views i did this random pattern it had 2000 views so maybe this is better so this keeps evolving this keeps emerging which we have not seen in any traditional computing system i mean you have a computing system to file your taxes all it does is the same you have a computing system to uh, web check in on your airline ticket all it does is the same there is no emergent capability now this emergent capability is the only thing that is different so it can help companies uh you know maintain a consistent tone in their marketing messages again it won't replace all the marketers because there's a lot of context lot of uh again today there is a human empathy that comes in yes these models are able to understand human empathy i mean you can ask these lat language models to uh let's say uh, write something in a professional way uh, i am so happy i am so excited i want to write about this it gives you that it understands sentiment but it's at a very very basic level not even that of 3 year old kid it's it is still not reached there so for companies and businesses especially the smaller ones uh, it can track multiple variables i mean that's how businesses scale up right for example there's a mom and pop store you walk in the storekeeper identifies you he knows your taste he gives you recommendations 
but this cannot scale over uh, you know when he has more than 100 customers and then something like a pandemic strikes and everything is all digital and obviously you cannot do it so these models can really augment businesses and again n- not threatening the employees uh, generally the the thing is it's it's not ai that is going to replace you it's somebody with access to these technologies is going to replace you so as employees as uh, companies even companies have to drive through a, a a thing where people are upskilling themselves they are aware on what ai technologies are on the table and how do you use it of course the caveat being we also hear stories about oh a company's whole code base was leaked out to a large language model and this is now causing them a lot of security issues so you need to have new kinds of awareness on how to preserve your company's ip how to ensure you're not leaking sensitive information to all of these models maybe th- there will be guardrails soon so that no personally identifiable information of your employees or your customers are going into these general purpose large scale models and like we talked about the entry barrier to ai is also coming down as we speak it's still not there yet so we will see the consolidation of making ai accessible and of ai becoming more and more relevant in whatever processes companies are trying to optimize by way of sending a consistent tone making the customer support experience good keeping employees happy enabling employees to upskill so that employee retention is also today employee retention is a very big problem so llms and ai can play a huge role in all of these areas it will only augment uh, like andrej karpati the famous ai researcher puts it he calls ai a software 2.0 it's it's not something that's going to take over the world because software 1.0 if somebody were to tell me as a human can you search through millions of records in a database and give results in less than a second's time it's superhuman same way today software can help you understand uh, natural language can read uh, text printed on images can help you find out your sentiment can also give you answers based on the knowledge that it has so it's just a natural evolution of software the same way software and and the good thing about software is touches all domains they say medicine touches all domains but things like let's say textile where does medicine come in but software touches everything so ai will also touch every domain depending on their state of digital adoption and as we spoke one side there's a digital thing on the other side there's also going to be a hardware aspect coming in so all of these combined will be a boon to companies and businesses yes um uh yes as you said uh, there are a lot of uh, use cases for an organization uh, when we talk about ai and its functionalities so there's a lot to come in the coming years i think uh, and thank you so much for your inputs and insights about uh, that uh, so we are almost at the end of this podcast thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for your time uh, i have a small uh, souvenir for you just wow Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. I appreciate the opportunity because I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.